Praise the Lord. Greetings to each one of you. Greetings to each one of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, as we know, we are um, continuing this series on the new and living way. Uh, I believe this is the 10th message that we've had. Um, over the last several weeks, we have been covering various aspects of this wonderful truth, which comes from Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 22. As you may be able to see in the next uh, slide, we have been going from the new covenant, new birth, new heart, new fruit, and now we are landed in a new family. Uh, last week, Joe uh, gave an overview uh, of this very concept, and in the next few, several weeks, we'll be breaking that down into small chunks so that all of us can be edified and all of us can come together and understand what it means to be a family that is spirit-filled, Christ-centered, and God-glorifying. Amen. Uh, let us turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 14 for today's meditation. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. No, the service is not over, uh, so you know you can remain be seated. Uh, this probably the first time we've had this said in the beginning of our service. Uh, so last week, uh, as we said, we've been going over the subtopic of the new family and one thing that we will realize as we are entering this new and living way through the crucified Christ is that God expects us to reflect that transformation, how we deal with others, especially those in our own home. And our attitude to those who are those in our home help us to naturally extend out that love to those around us, especially those in the church and those beyond. And so this verse that we are very familiar with that we hear at the end of almost every service is a, is a, is a declaration of blessing. This is essentially saying, Paul is saying to the church in Corinth that may all the fullness of God be with you. And in this verse, if we break down this verse, we see three persons are mentioned here. We see the Lord Jesus Christ. We see God, or also we can say God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And three attributes here we see is what grace and uh, love and fellowship. And you know, in, in the Greek, we, we know these terms fairly well because of messages and things we learn. You know, grace is charis and, and love is agape and communion is koinonia. And so in the, the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, triune God, out of this one God, we have all these attributes flow out in like an ever-flowing stream out into all creation. And as the creation of God, human beings, we, these are three things, among many, but these are three things that we deeply need in our own life as well. And God knows that. The God knows that we need grace, love, and fellowship. And our homes and our churches should be the practical manifestation of, of this grace and love and, and fellowship. And, and the triune God who extends this grace, love, and fellowship to us also expects us to extend this out to the, this love and this grace and this fellowship that we have received into others, especially those in our family and those in our church and beyond. So if you and I want to experience a family life, especially that is pleasing in the sight of God, we ought to model our conduct to how God deals with us. Otherwise, if, we, if God is not at the center of defining how we ought to behave to one another, then it's going to be the culture. It's going to be what is new that day. It's going to be what is, what, you know, what is in fashion, what is not, you know. And so... Our focus and our steady determination ought to be to, to, be, uh, to, to be those who show the love of Christ, the show the, the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with others and, and bear that fruit. And so over the course of uh, this message, I, I want to focus on how can we become 
the people of grace, love, and fellowship. So there are three things that I believe when it comes to before we do anything practically that we, uh, and in the next slide I have this laid out, there are three things that, uh, the three steps. It's to, one, we need to know. We need to know, and in the context of this verse, we need to know what grace, love, and fellowship is. And, and the thing is that oftentimes we have our own definitions that we may have heard through, it might be messages, it might be uh, just our own intuition about these things. So we need to know but from the word of God itself, what does it mean to be someone full of grace, full of love, and someone who has fellowship with others? Second, we need to receive. Once we know what this is, there ought to be a, a, a thirst and a hunger within us to receive this, this very thing that we cannot produce within ourselves. When we understand how God defines grace, love, and fellowship, it's going to create in us an awareness of our shortcomings. That I don't have this love, grace, and I don't have it sometimes this desire to have this holy, sacrificial fellowship with one another. So in that state, and I'll cover that a little more deeply, is that we will in, in, in develop within us a thirst and a hunger to ask for the very same thing that we are coming to know about. And finally, as we receive this love, grace, and fellowship, it, it creates a drive within us, which is in this very heart of God himself, to extend and to be an overflowing channel of this grace, love, and fellowship. So as we break down these three things of grace, love, and fellowship, let us quickly go through and just, just it might be a reminder, it might be, uh, it might be something, some things you might hear new or just, a, uh, you know, uh, just another reinforcement. But when we think about God's grace, um, we all quickly know what God's grace is. It's God's unmerited favor. I mean, that is a, a textbook Sunday school answer that each one of us be able to say. And also, and practically speaking, we, we define grace as a, a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. I mean, that, and that's how we see and that's how we define grace in day-to-day in, in -day life. But grace is beyond that. Grace is beyond, well, although the definition undeserved favor is a good definition, we, it's good to also kind of dwell in to, to understand what grace is uh, all about from a, from a holistic standpoint. So, you know, when it comes to grace, there is the justifying grace, right? We're by, through grace, by grace we are saved through faith. There's a, you're saved by grace. There's a sanctifying grace. There's a grace that teaches us to say no to sin and, 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 te and, and leads us into paths of righteousness. There's, a, there's an empowering grace, and that's one I will highlight here in a little bit, that uh, enables us and gives us the power to live the Christian life and to do His work. Then there's a grace that will lead us home. There's a grace that in the day of resurrection, in the day of Christ, that will take us to the presence of God as, as people with the heavenly body, as, as and we see Christ as He is. That's the glorifying grace that we will also receive one day. So when, uh, when we look at, especially I want to focus on the empowering grace uh, for a second here. The Corinthian church, and this is this passage, is this verse is to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church understood another uh, dimension of God's grace. As, as Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 when he talks about his, the thorn in the flesh and he talks about his weaknesses in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he says, my grace is, and Jesus tells uh, Paul this, that my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. So this grace that is sufficient is a grace that enables, that, that empowers and strengthens Paul in his very weak moments uh, in, his, in, his, in his inabilities, in his, in his trials, in his struggles. And so when we define grace, when we, th when we ask, when, when uh, Paul is praying over this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be upon this congregation in Corinthians, and as we, as we practically live that out, it's something to think about is, how are we extending this kind of grace, this strengthening, empowering grace to others that we know, especially in our family and those in, in our church, uh, those that are brothers and sisters in Christ. It is not just 
just uh, showing grace when they do something wrong, but there's something beyond that. Just recognize the weaknesses and the challenges that our brothers and sisters are going through and to be a, a, a strengthening support to them is, is, is a form of grace that we can show to our brothers and sisters. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells this to Timothy, just to reinforce this point, Paul tells Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. So that, that kind of gives you an idea of, I just wanted to give you another perspective of grace that is beyond the, the, what the, the grace that we know. And, and just to reiterate what everybody knows, that sometimes it is hard for us to extend grace when someone does us wrong. We like to hold on to grudges. We like to prolong forgiveness because we want them to suffer the punishment, whether it is a broken relationship, whether it is, um, you know, whether it is some level of suffering that we want them to suffer just a little bit before we extend grace. And this is, again, a, a mirror into our own heart to, uh, that, that maybe we don't understand and know what the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is. This undeserving, this uh, unconditional grace that he gives to us sinners. And if we understand that, although we're not perfect, we ought to quickly have a conviction in our heart when we do not extend that same grace to others that I am in the wrong right now. If not, you do not understand grace. At some level in your heart, you think you deserve this. You deserve salvation. And so this is something for us to remind ourselves is, when we do not extend grace, and ask the question of ourselves, do I know what grace is all about? Second is love. You know, when we uh, talk about love, and we have mentioned that in many messages over and over, all of us can probably, uh, know, probably know where I'm going with this also. You know, there's the same Corinthian church that received, that, that received this blessing, that I, the verse that I read also received a definition of love like no other church. And we know 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul essentially says, it doesn't matter if you have all these gifts and you can claim a lot of things that can give to the poor and, and you're so noisy and, and all of that. But if you don't have love, all these things are just noise. It's, just, it's, 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 it's in vain. Everything that you claim to have means nothing. And, and so let me just, let's just read it uh, just for our remembrance. First Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things endures all things this is the definition of love and practically we know the definition the demonstration of God's love is shown through us in Christ while we were yet sinners Christ died for us that is the ultimate practical revelation of God's love but when we read these verses also it, it tells us right away we can all already know in our heart where we have fallen short and this is why I, I mentioned earlier about the part of you know, the part of asking, asking for his love. Finally, the definition of fellowship. Uh, I have more to go, but I, I, I'm covering the, about the knowing part right now. In fellowship, and the Corinthian church knew this as well. When the, the, when the epistle to the Corinthians was mentioned, uh, in the beginning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul tells us to the church, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is like the, it was almost like the theme statement of this whole epistle because Paul is then going to talk about divisions. He's going to talk about uh, the lawsuits going on in the church. He's going to talk about a, a, a very serious sin that's even shameful for unbelievers. He, he's going to talk about just the, the, the chaos happening in, in the lack of order. But he's reminding them in the beginning of the epistle that it is in the faithfulness of God that we have been called into fellowship Amen. with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And in this verse that we read in 1st, 2nd Corinthians chapter 13, it says here that the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. And, and this fellowship is with God himself. And, and I like when the, that the term holy is mentioned, that just to remind ourselves, the Holy Spirit is holy this fellowship that we have with God is a one of purity, one, uh, one of holiness, 
one of sincerity, openness, transparency. This is not some act that we are putting together. The fellowship with God is, is true and it is, it is holy and it is pure. And how does the Holy Spirit, and we've been hearing messages on this, but as a reminder, how does the Holy Spirit have fellowship with us? Because clearly in this relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit, He has the upper hand. He is far and above. Uh, you know, there's no co-equal thing going on here. This is God having fellowship with us, indwelling in us. How does He help us? He's, he's in, you know, we know this, Romans chapter 8, 26, like, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we are, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So here's the Holy Spirit showing to us what fellowship means. And here we can apply this to how we extend fellowship to one another. Now, second, uh, I said no, right? No. And now we're going to talk about receiving. And this is just a very short point. Very, uh, I've already mentioned it. I'm just going to say it again. That you know, Jesus over and over in, 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 the, in the Gospels, he, t he yeah, says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. And the problem that, that we have sometimes is we have never done this. We have never asked. We, have, we just sit there. We just sit there and hope that God just falls on us, that God just, you know, just happens, you know. And, and, and so you know, in James chapter 4, verses 2, uh, part of 2, it says, You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. So there's one thing is that we don't ask. Second thing, our motives are wrong in asking. And this is something to ask ourselves. When we ask and we desperately know, when we understand what grace is, love is, fellowship is in God, and we see, we see a deficit in us, first of all, are we asking? And second of all, why are we asking? This is something to ask ourselves. Finally, sharing in this love and fellowship. And I, I will go a little bit deeply here just to talk about certain issues that we can see because of the deficit of love, grace, and fellowship. When it comes to issues at home, you know, families are places where love, grace, and fellowship are least seen. You know, and, and at home is where we, are, we share the worst opinions of each other. This is because we have the freedom to do that. It, we are our, in our own skin. We, um, we can be honest at home. And so we, we sometimes say the worst things to each other. At the same time, we assume a lot of things. that We assume we, they, that our spouse, our children, our parents know that we love them because we're there. We're helping out whenever uh, they need something. And we assume that, that our, our relatives, those who are close to us, know, our church members even, know that we love them because we're there. We're, we're present. But, you know, even in this day, of pre when you talk about presence, even that is very much uh, diluted because of the distractions that we have, whether it's so media and, and phones and devices and things that creep into our homes that we are there, we're sitting there, but we're yet not there. And, and, and just being there in, in bodily presence is not what presence is, right? And so when we are at home, oftentimes for many, it seems like the worst place to be. And, and, and so when, we, and I, when I lay this out, I'm, I'm also not saying uh, by any means that there's no redemption there. I, I'm trying to lead us into to redemption by saying this, that when, when homes become like this, it is the word, the enemy, what the enemy does to us is to say, this is how it's going to be. That this is it. This is, this is reality. I'm just going to accept this as it is. We're always going to fight. We're always going to have this challenge. Or, and then eventually there's this, this separation that happens within the home mentally and, and later physically. And so and this, this becomes a bad combination because if we don't have this grace, love, and fellowship from God, right? If we don't have this, and especially with the honesty that we show at home, not having this grace, love, and fellowship, and being utterly honest at home, it, it doesn't enable us to foster a good relationship with one another. 
Because without knowing God's grace, you cannot forgive someone who is being a little challenging, right? Without having the love of God in your heart, you cannot show love for somebody who is being unloving. Without understanding the fellowship that God has with you and me, we are not able to go out of our way to seek fellowship with someone who is being a little bit resistant. And the same thing is in church. You know, with the COVID season, it, 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 you know, some of it is based on th that need of, uh, of keeping separation and all of that. But, you know, increasingly there's a low priority that we are giving to true fellowship. A, a fellowship that's uh, defined as God is having, a, a God is having with us a, a, a fellowship of reaching out and, and this, this unity that we can find in the spirit with one another. This one anotherness is it, we're finding it more common in, with blood relatives, and that is that even the pagans do that, as Jesus has often said. But in the Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to find that we, that you and I, are both in fellowship with the same Holy Spirit, and that is our uniting point with one another. We have to see past our differences, our age differences, our cultural differences, our regional differences, and to recognize that if the Holy Spirit can have fellowship with that brother or sister, and the Holy Spirit is having fellowship with me, what is, there, what is, what is the difference between that person and I? And, that, and that's how Paul even uh, reached out to a feuding, two feuding women in, in, the, in the epistle of Philippi, uh, Philippians, Eudokia and Syndiki, saying that if there's any communion in the Spirit, that's one of his ways of trying to engage these two women, saying if there's any communion in the Spirit, be of one mind. Have the mind of Christ. Consider the other person greater than you are. Leave behind your own self-interest for the interest of others. This is how we can practically bring and share fellowship is by reminding ourselves of the truth, first of all, of knowing what grace, love, and fellowship is all about. Hallelujah. When we talk about grace, and I also have to talk about uh, love and fellowship here. When we talk about grace, uh, grace is also seen in how we talk. Let your speech always be gracious. Colossians 4, 6. Evidence of God's grace in us is in also, it's made evident through how we speak. Sometimes internally we might feel just fine with the brother and sister, but when we speak, the true intent of the heart comes out. We might be so surprised by how that person takes that comment, but it is a bias in our heart. That is, the abundance of the heart is full of biases and, and a lot of different misunderstandings that, that out of that abundance, we, it, split, it comes out of our mouth and we don't realize the amount of hurt is happening. And I, my heart goes out to many, uh, I'm saying even honestly, even in this church that are hurt by comments, whether it is about their age, their, their status in life, lack of job, whatever it may be, that, that, that comments come thrown at them and they, they can't stand being here because there's a lack of grace in that, in that speech. There's a lack of grace in the comments. Maybe uh, the way that you look. You know, it, it may be the way you dress. Now, th there should be proper ways of doing all those things. I, I'm not saying any of that. But our grace, our, our speech should be full of grace, seasoned with salt. And when we talk about strengthening grace, our grace our, our, the grace that comes out of us has to strengthen others. It needs to be a grace that em empower others, that lift up others. So if there is something that, that you think does not lift up a person, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself because it, doesn't, it does not do any good. Now we talk about love. Romans 8.38 we know the wonderful verse there that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, right? That is the wonderful truth that we love to hear for ourselves. But I ask, I'm asking everyone, including myself, that is there anything that would separate our love for our spouses, our children, our relatives, our church members? If we have received a kind of love from Christ that will never separate us, why do we have such conditional love for those, especially in our families. And finally, in fellowship, you know, when in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, you know, Paul recounts his uh, whole experience of, 
of meeting the apostles, right? Peter, uh, the, the pillars he called them. And it says that when Barnabas took Paul to th these apostles, they extended the right hand of fellowship. This man who was an enemy, who was a persecutor, uh, who did a lot of damage to the church, when they realized that, that Christ had visited him, he extended this right hand of fellowship. And that fellowship, that right hand of fellowship, indicated a level of trust and affirmation, a commitment that you are a brother in Christ. And, and, and that extension of that fellowship to, to Paul indicated to him that he is one among them. Uh, and Paul, as a result, you know, he does the same for someone else as well. In the letter to Philemon, we all know this, that, you know, Paul's whole letter is, is, a, is a plea to, uh, to Philemon to take back his former bondservant, uh, Onesimus, who they say perhaps stole something from Philemon and, and fled from him and was imprisoned with Paul. And in that imprisonment, Paul shared the gospel to Onesimus, this, this bondservant, who was later, he became a brother in Christ. Yes. If you look, read through some of that, it, it's, really, uh, it's really encouraging. In verse 16 of Philemon, Paul says, he's no longer a slave or a bondservant, but more than a slave, he's, he's a beloved brother. And in, here's where Paul, we can see the, the, the intent of Paul's, the, the extent of Paul's fellowship. He says to Philemon, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Amen. This is how much love, go, how love goes deep into taking others' burdens as, as our own. In a church like this, family members, we all, at the end of the day, we will die for one another. And I, that, I, I'm not, I know we will provide for our family members' needs. But beyond that, in a church body like this, how far will we go to extend this kind of fellowship of bearing one another's burdens? Or do we have a, let them, that's their own business. I don't need to do anything about that. I don't need to care. I don't need to, that's not any of my concern. And, and God wants us to extend beyond the blood relationships and to emulate a lot of the early church and how the Spirit of God led that early church to have to see things in common to whatever you can to extend of being that helping hand to one another to seeing one another's burdens and issues as your own whether it's through prayer or taking it up to prayer or through, through other means of giving or, or being a support God wants us to extend the fellowship that he has given with us with us formerly enemies to one another from our, to our brothers and sisters in Christ and as I invite the worship team to come forward Just to recap everything, that we cannot show this grace and love and fellowship without knowing what grace, love, and fellowship is. And so I encourage each of us, and encouraging myself too, to never stick with the definition that this world has to offer when it comes to these three things, but to look into Scripture deeply to search scriptures and to seek the Lord deeply, to understand, Jesus, what does it mean for me to be full of grace, full of love, and to be in fellowship with you? Let us look to the Lord and, and to see how beautiful He is, the triune God. What a wonderful verse here we see about the beauty of the triune God giving us His grace, love, and fellowship. And this is what we need to marvel on, is to know and see more of God so that we will have a thirst within us to ask, to knock, to, to, to seek more of His qualities and more of His characteristics in our life. And as we receive, I'm telling you, as we receive from the Lord, we will give. Because as we receive, we cannot keep it within sight. It's a transformative the thing that happens when the Lord pours out His grace, pours out His love, pours out His, and, 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 and extends that hand of fellowship with us. We will have the inner drive that no one can contain us to extend that same grace, love, and fellowship with one another. Hallelujah. Let us pray for a moment. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of, praise, uh, throne of grace, O Lord God. 
We heard your word this morning and we thank you, oh God, that you are a God who extends grace, love, and fellowship for us, especially those, oh God, who, who have been foreigners and enemies, oh God, who've been children of darkness. You have brought us into the marvelous light. You have called us to be your adopted children, oh Lord. You, the, your spirit has given us the cry, Abba, Father. We are the bride of Christ who is bought in fellowship with Jesus Christ. We are bought by the precious blood of Christ. And help us, oh God, to seek you, to, to understand that truth more, more deeply, oh Lord God, so that we can become the same vessels of grace, love, and we can extend the hand of fellowship to our brothers and sisters around us. We give you all the praise, glory, honor, God, for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.